Greetings and welcome to the Richard Olin Show, where every week we fight the good fight. Very happy to be here with you on uh, February 7th, 2023. Wow. A few weeks ago for one of my programs, I interviewed Alan Levine. Actually, Helen and I did four interviews and I um, was very happy about the feedback that uh, we got for those. Alan was a former member of the group APRO. He worked very closely with James and Coral Lorenzen, who ran that organization for many years. For those of you who don't know, APRO is, uh, without a doubt, one of the leading UFO research organizations in the world uh, from the 1950s until they uh, dissolved in the 19, late 1980s, a long time. Uh, Alan was with him in the starting in the mid 70s. And one thing that he talked about during our interview, and this was a bit of a surprise, I think, to a lot of people, was the knowledge within that organization in the mid 70s of UFO crash retrievals. Uh, in fact, it was just common knowledge within that organization. And the impression that one gets is that from their circle of colleagues and friends. Now, that's interesting because this is before anyone was talking about Roswell in the public realm. I mean, the first Roswell book wasn't published until 1980. And there was a bit of research about Roswell in the late 70s. You know, keep in mind, Roswell happened in 1947. Uh, there was the famous newspaper uh, in the Roswell Daily Record reporting about this. But then the whole thing just was silenced for the next th three decades. And the UF, the, within the UFO field, the crash retrieval subject was pretty much a non-starter, at least publicly. But what we are now understanding is that, no, behind the scenes, there was a lot of talk about crash retrievals, or at least, I don't know if a lot of talk is the right way to put it, but there was an understanding among a number of serious researchers that objects had come down they had been acquired by the United States government. And, you know, I think the, the problem that people had was how do you, how do you prove it? You can talk about this story or that story. And it wasn't really until Roswell got kind of dug up, so to speak, that there's a lot of testimony that people, I think, started feeling confident that they could get into it. But I guess my point here is that there was a definite understanding of the reality of UFO crash retrievals earlier than we sometimes are willing to recognize. So we're going to start with that because I'm going to re-explore some of that history. Now, I want to emphasize that this UFO history that I'm going to be discussing, I firmly believe that we are very much in danger of losing our history. It's not just that we want to study history for its own sake. No, we're not about that. We want to know the history, in this case of UFOs, because it has direct relevance to our situation today. To the conversation about UFOs in the public realm today, this old stuff, the historical stuff matters. I feel that like we're moving into a time of what just seems to be genuine historical amnesia. And when that happens, when we lose our heritage, when we lose our history, we are so vulnerable to manipulation from unethical and self-serving purposes. It happens all the time. We don't want that to happen. It all comes down to self-knowledge. We need to know who we are, what we are. And a big part of that is our history. What were we? What has been the path of this UFO subject for all these years? And these are not trivial questions because when you start looking at some of that information from way back when, you begin to get a very different understanding of the present. And when it comes to UFOs, this makes a difference. Knowing the history gives us a very different understanding of this incredibly important phenomenon. So what I have for you on this program is information from 65 years ago, from 1958, that explicitly makes the following claims. One, that there were multiple UFO crash retrievals. Uh, two, that there was uh, a U.S.-sponsored disinformation and censorship campaign against UFOs. And three, that, yes, there was an international coordinated cover-up of the UFO subject. And the, the man that I'll be uh, focusing this, this presentation around 
for uh, this evening is this gentleman here, Dr. Olavo Fontes of Brazil. Uh, Olavo Fontes was by far the most active and important Brazilian UFO researcher of the early period of the UFO subject. So during the 1950s and 60s, he died way too early in the late 1960s. But Fontes was the main uh, correspondent and representative of the organization APRO, which I was just talking about, in Brazil. So uh, Fontes wrote regularly to uh, Coral and Jim Lorenzen, who ran APRO, that stands for Aerial Phenomena Research Organization. And Fontes was deeply engaged in investigating a number of very high profile UFO cases in Brazil during that time when he wasn't busy looking like a movie star. Look at this guy. He's just perfectly, perfectly put together. Every photograph that I've ever seen of Fontes, he's just very dapper, very well put together. But he was a first rate UFO investigator. And I think outside of Brazil is not really appreciated nearly enough for just how great he was for what he did. So I will be talking about uh, a very long letter he wrote in early 1958 to Coral Lorenzen. But before I, I get into that letter, I want to give a little bit of background, um, particularly on a what seems to have been a UFO crash of some sort in Brazil from September of 1957 in uh, this area here. This is very close to Sao Paulo in a town or a region known as Ubatuba. And it's, uh, at least at the time, it may still be, it was very much a kind of a natural, um, almost like a wilderness, wildernessy area, even though near Sao Paulo, this was something of a, a preserve. And it was here at a beach where a very extraordinary event is said to have happened. In fact, I think it absolutely did happen. And this is the Uba Tuba event. So I want to describe a little bit of that to you because that's relevant uh, in terms of what Fontes is writing about a few months later. So this took place in September of 1957. I have a, an image of, a, this is I think an artist rendition of the event, but it works pretty well. Uh, this is near a, a a beach known as Tonin Haas Beach, very small town. And what you had is that witnesses reported seeing something come out of the sky at around noon, broad daylight, coming out with incredible velocity um, before it exploded into pieces over the sea and onto land. Uh, locals quickly collected a number of the debris. They were very light, very metallic, could not be identified. Um, later analysis did show to have an extraordinarily high level of magnesium, almost pure magnesium. Initially, in fact, it was believed to be 100% magnesium. I think later analysis showed it to be 99.3% magnesium. That's very, very exceptionally pure. And it has stumped experts to this day, by the way. Uh, there, I, I was informed, I think this is true, my apologies if I'm wrong, that Dr. Gary Nolan right now has... I think the remaining original piece of Ubatuba uh, that is still available for study. And in fact, I believe in uh, more recent years, some Brazilian researchers have acquired additional pieces. At least this is what uh, I read. I, you know, I don't know if it's exactly true. I think it may be true. Uh, this would not shock me if this event were as spectacular as it was, you would have had a lot of people collecting these pieces. In any case, it's called the Ubatuba incident, and it is, without a doubt, it is still one of the most mysterious UFO events in our history. So you have a situation in which a large number of Brazilian beachgoers were basically shocked when this object descends toward the beach. Just before it reaches the shore, it, it ascends in altitude. This is a thing where it's described with tremendous uh, velocity, and then it explodes into this incredible display of white flames and sparks uh, and fragments that it resembled fireworks, according to the witness who wrote about this. Uh, it showered pieces all over the, uh, the area, including many um, of these falling like at the shore, some in the water, others on the beach, and a few individuals got enough courage to collect some of these pieces afterwards. Uh, the, the statement was that these pieces, uh, these materials 
more metallic, but were very lightweight like paper. So sounds a little familiar, like Roswell perhaps, right? On September 14th, 1957, there was a Brazilian uh, Sao Paulo newspaper called O Globo, which printed a letter. And in fact, uh, it was courtesy of this journalist here, uh, Ibrahim Sued. He was actually one of the most prominent journalists in Brazil at the time and for many years after. He had a very prominent career. He was not just some run-of-the-mill uh, journalist. He was a very important guy. And uh, one of the witnesses wrote to him, and uh, this is part of the letter. You can read it here. He featured this in his column. Uh, what was interesting is that the person who wrote to him, uh, Sued apparently was a UFO skeptic. He was not some guy who was into the subject, but they sent him uh, several fragments of the crash, I think four pieces, uh, just to trust him with it, I suppose, and to say, look, I trust you more than any other journalist, and please write about this and see if you can get this tested, do, do whatever. You're in a better position than we are, basically, was what the letter said. Um, so he publishes this. And, and then, you know, he is contacted by Olivo Fontes. And Fontes uh, reads the article and his, oh, by the way, here's a, an, a, a fragment. So he's a, this is an early photograph of them. This is what they look like, very small. And this is what Sued had there. So Fontes reads about this and he's thinking initially that this is probably some kind of meteorite or some kind, not some kind of natural phenomenon. That was his initial thought, but he, he's intrigued enough by the story. He's into UFOs, flying saucers. He's like, all right, this guy's in town. I'm nearby him. Um, back in those days, I was reading, like everyone's name was in a telephone book, and it was actually very easy to reach uh, an individual. If you had the phone book, you could just look them up, give them a phone call. And Fontes calls Suet, and they actually meet uh, Suet is impressed enough by Fontes' uh, dedication that he's like, look, I don't, this is really not my interest. You want to study this? Have at it. Here are the fragments. So they, um, Fontes describes this. He says they were like a dull gray, solid substance. The surface wasn't glossy. It seemed cracked by oxidation. The images that we have here, I'm not really sure how old those were at the time that they were uh, photographed. So forgive me for that. But Fontes did say that he took these to the Ministry of Agriculture's Mineral Production Laboratory, which then went on to analyze the elements that were in there. And this is when they uh, discovered this is exceptionally high magnesium. In fact, I think their initial Re, uh, reply was that this is pure magnesium, which is like, how is this possible to come from a fragment that comes from out of the sky and just uh, explodes after ascending? Um, so, you know, it didn't make sense. This is still a mystery to this day. In any case, now several months have gone by and Fontes is writing an update to Coral Lorenzen, who, of course, co-founder of APRO. And this is a letter dated February 27, 1958. And in fact, um, I believe I have an image of the letter here. Let me, this is from a website. I, I couldn't find this in any published book, but this is online and you can see the um, web address below. If you just uh, type in the title here, this is actually from a French site, but it's the letter is in English um, and you can just read it there. But uh, and in fact, let me just show you another um, image here. Fontes is writing to Coral Lorenzen. She wrote about this. That's Coral Lorenzen on the right. A book called Flying Saucers, a Startling Evidence of the Invasion from Outer Space, kind of a dramatic title. This is actually a reprint from an earlier book she wrote from the early 1960s under a slightly different title, uh, which was called The UFO Hoax. Not that UFOs were a hoax, but that the cover-up was a hoax. That was her rather... Uh, kind of a difficult title, and I think that's why they renamed this book. But anyway, she wrote about uh, some of the Ubatuba event 
actually a lot of it in this particular book. She did not have Fonte's letter that I'm about to uh, refer to. So he writes to her on February 27, 1958. And he's basically informing her a bit about uh, some of the Ubatuba drama that you know followed up on the, his investigation. And what he says is that at uh, 6.30 in the evening in his office, this is late February, 1958, his nurse had just left. He's a doctor, he has a practice. So his nurse had just left, he's alone, and he gets a visit from two men in his office. They apparently show their credentials as intelligence officers with the Brazilian Navy. And they say to him that their visit was, um, I think what triggered their visit was that he had gone earlier that day to the Brazil's Ministry of, um, of the Navy. They had an office there. He was there. And so that's why they said that they were there. He had gone there. That's what he said to Cora Lorenzen. Uh, but obviously they also knew a lot about his uh, work as a UFO investigator in general. As he was looking at the Ubatuba incident. He was also looking, and I'm going to talk about this a little later. He was gen then just starting to look at an incident at a nearby location at a place called Fort Itaipu, in which two soldiers got very badly burned from a UFO. I, I will talk about that in a minute. Anyway, initially they come in and they're friendly, but they then basically give a chill to him. <laughs> they make it clear that this was not a social call. And what they say to him is, uh, I think this is the slide here. Yes. Uh, you know too much about things you were not entitled to know. We don't like that. Besides, your activities concerning the those fragments you possess are very undesirable and might be dangerous to you. We would like to warn you to stop all of your investigations connected with these fragments. We request also the samples in your hands, in your possession perhaps, to be delivered to us as soon as possible. So... I think the English translation is a little awkward, but Fontes is translating this into English for Coral Lorenzen. This conversation obviously took place in uh, Portuguese. And and I just copied this uh, part that he wrote here, which I just love. He says, I interrupted him at that moment. I was not frightened, but angry and trying hard to control my temper. My dear friend, I said, I'm afraid you don't have any conception of what country this is this. This is a free country. And you aren't entitled to say what I can or can't do. If you came here to threaten me, you can stop now and go out through that door and tell your military chiefs I have no fear of their ridiculous menace. I also have friends in the armed forces and elsewhere, and I know they have no power to interfere legally with my activities. Uh, how do you not love that? This is 1958, and he's... He's still in the era where people were like, hey, we have rights, we have freedoms. You can't tell me what to do. Uh, how, do you let, how do you not like that? Anyway, according to what Fontes wrote to Coral Lorenz, and he said, all right, the, the demeanor of this man changed immediately. And they're like, no, 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 you've misunderstood. We're just offering you advice you and take it or leave it. All we want to do is make sure that, that this visit remains unofficial and private, is what he says. So it seemed very clear what was happening that uh, they're telling Fontes, like, you've discovered some very confidential information about flying saucers, and you don't understand just how important this is. You don't understand the significance. You're missing important things. And so what the officers are saying to him now, after, after the threat didn't really work, they're saying, look, we will, uh, we'll be like partners. So we will share some information with you, but we are asking you for your cooperation to report any UFO sightings or landings, they said this, back to us. Don't go through any channels, just go directly to us. And, um, you know, this is what we're asking. So we're going to give you some information. And in return, we ask for you to keep us in the loop on important things that are happening. Very interesting, right? And they're like, you know, we have a small organization. We need extra help. 
Um, in other countries, civilians aren't so eager to cooperate and we're, we really could use your help. That's all. You can relax now, the guy said. So again, this is all in Fonte's letter, which I encourage you to read. It's a fascinating letter. Uh, and what he says is, it's like, all right, I basically let them believe that I was going to be willing to work with them. I gave them this um, attitude of being open to what they were discussing. And then what ended up happening is that uh, they had a two hour conversation. So in the two hours, Fontes writes to Coral Lorenzen and he says, this is what they told me, 11 points. So this is point number one, which is that uh, you know, governments and military authorities around the world know that flying saucers exist and that they are from another planet. Uh, apparently, they have absolute proof of both of these facts. Uh, second, there were six flying disks already have crashed on this earth. This is 1958 and were captured and were taken apart, he said, by militaries and scientists of the countries involved, he said, under like extreme uh, security to keep this absolutely secret. And he gave some information about where these disks had crashed, or at least the, the Brazilian Navy guys gave Fontes information, which he then relayed to Coral Lorenzen. Uh, one, so we're talking 1940s and 50s here. One supposedly crashed in the Sahara Desert, but was too destroyed to be of any use. He said three crash in the United States, two of them in very good condition. The fifth one crashed uh, somewhere in the British Isles. And then the last one, they said, came down in one of the Scandinavian countries. And those two were almost undamaged as well. Uh, just continuing on with this, they went on and said these six disks all were uh this is very confusing, either 32, 72, or 99 feet in diameter. Those are the only sizes he gave, 32 feet, 72 feet, 99 feet. And uh, I think it was the Aztec crash that was said to be 99 feet in diameter. And so here he is in 1958 giving that same information. Uh, they also said, along with this point of crash retrievals, that uh, dead Alien bodies were found in all of them. These were just described as little men. They were ranging in height from 32 inches to 46 inches, a little under three feet to a little under four feet. Uh, they were all dead. They were killed in the, in the crash. The examination of the body showed they were definitely humanoid, but obviously not from this planet. That's according to what these men told Fontes. Uh, the ships were all saucer shaped with a dome. Uh, they were all made of very light metal, which was assembled in segments that fitted in deep grooves and were pinned together around the base. He's writing this in 1958. This was, in fact, the claim of the, uh, I think, the Kingman craft uh, that came down in 1953. I believe it was Kingman. Um, Kingman or Aztec, I think Kingman. But uh, in any case, he, he said that you couldn't tell from the outer surface of the ships, but they would come apart. Uh, some of the craft, they said, had portals made of some very exotic unknown type of glass. And there were a lot of other unknown materials that were found inside the ships. So now I'll just uh, take a little uh, side travel here. Uh, I'll just say for the record, we can more or less corroborate, uh, I would say five out of the six cases that they're talking about. So I, I went through, Ryan Woods, a very excellent book on UFO crash retrievals called Magic Eyes Only. It is unfortunately out of print. Would love to see that book back in print. I, I'm lucky I've got a copy. Um, and it's a very useful. He's, he did, this is in the late 90s when he wrote it, a very comprehensive look of all of the crash retrieval cases that were discussed um, up to that point. Uh, only the Sahara case doesn't seem to have an entry. Now, the American cases could be from any number of candidates since there's more than three alleged crash retrievals in America from the 40s and 50s. You've got Cape Girardeau of 1941. You've got the Trinity crash, which was just recently written about by Jacques Vallée and Paola Harris. 
that's 1945. You've got Roswell, 1947. You've got the Aztec, New Mexico uh, crash of 1948. You have the Del Rio, Texas case of 1950. And you've got Kingman, Arizona, 1953. Those are only the most significant ones. There are others that are also potentially important, but these six, I think, are quite prominent. And you know, you might ask, well, why are then are the Brazilians only telling him about three American crashes, not six or more? I would say there's really no reason why you would expect these Brazilian officers to know about every single American UFO crash recovery. Why would they know? Uh, it's not their country. They're intelligence officers, but that does not mean that they're going to get full data on everything. They're, you know, very likely scrambling to figure this out, just like other other organizations are as well. Now, the British, uh, the alleged British recovery is a little more sketchy, but in uh, Ryan Wood's book, I did, uh, he did have some corroborating information about this. And actually, I think he traced it, information about it, to a potential inside leak by the famous Lord Mountbatten, who did have a very strong interest in UFOs and a lot of knowledge of it. Uh, the, the British case is believed to have occurred during the Second World War. That would make it earlier than Roswell, probably earlier than the Trinity uh, case as well. Interesting. We don't have a lot of information about it, unfortunately. Uh, the Scandinavian case, in my view, could be one of two things. It could refer to the ghost rockets of 1946, in which we do know that the Swedish government did acquire some of the pieces of uh, whatever it was that came down there. Uh, we do know that, and that comes from a Swedish declassified document. It could also refer, though, to an infamous case from 1952 in Spitsbergen, Norway. A lot of people believe that is a hoax. It could very well have been a hoax. However, that event was reported in several German publications at the time, and it is true that a number of people did think that this was possibly legit when it happened, and I wonder if these Brazilian officers suspected that it was the real deal as well. We don't really know. Again, we just have to remember, uh, simply because these men had some information on the subject, doesn't mean that like everything that they knew was accurate. Um, we don't really know. All we know is what Fontes wrote to Coral Lorenzen in this particular letter. So, uh, so that's the end of that. Uh, let me move to the third point. I don't think there's anything else really that I have for point number two. Let's just pull this back up. Point number three, what these men said to him is that we examined the um, instruments and devices aboard these discs. And, um, and they also said, we believe they're, they're, they move by some kind of extremely powerful electromagnetic field. Um, and they gave a little bit of detail on that as well. And then number four, uh, well, I kind of mentioned this already. The ships were carefully dismantled and studied. Um, what they did not understand, the, the men said, was how the fields were produced, uh, like what was the source of the tremendous amount of uh, energy that would be released through these fields that allowed these craft to, to go. Uh, they didn't have any clues. They didn't really know where they got their power from and and so forth. I mean, there's speculation that this was some kind of nuclear engine, but I, you know, I don't think that these Brazilian officers, at least whatever they told Fontes, didn't really seem to indicate that they had a clear idea. Uh, point number five, the scientists believed that they could find a way that it would be possible to do this, but they didn't know yet how to convert energy this part confused me a little bit because what they said, convert energy from a nuclear reactor directly to into electric power. Uh, I always thought that's what nuclear power plants do exactly. And there were nuclear, uh, there was nuclear power by the late fifties, but um, maybe they're talking about something else here. I'm not really quite sure. Part number six, point number six, uh, there had been a number of attempts to shoot these objects down. They generally were not successful. Uh, and aircraft had been lost, multiple aircraft had been lost in the attempt to do that. And, you know, basically they were saying our militaries are just totally outclassed by these things. And in fact, there were attempts to use guided missiles to shoot these. 
That did not work either. These craft are way faster than even guided missiles. And so that's that. Uh, they also actually went on. They said, look, these things have the ability to paralyze um, our electronics, our electrical systems, our radar. Uh, they can interfere with our radio and television apparatuses, our, and they can uh, short circuit our, our electric power plants, uh, that type of thing. Uh, he goes on, point number seven. They, they haven't shown any interest in contacting us, at least up till now. Um, the, the guys, uh, the men said, well, they're obviously preparing some kind of planet-wide huge military operation. Uh, they were actually expressed concern that they were in danger from these aliens. Is there going to be some kind of war? What What's this going to be? We don't really, we don't know that they're hostile, but we don't like the way it looks, essentially is the impression that they gave them. Uh, they said that there's international cooperation from militaries and governments around the world. They are being informed about the situation. There's an exchange of information through intelligence services and top secret military conferences were being held every now and then or periodically to discuss any new developments going on. Uh, in fact, they said the Brazilian Navy receives monthly, this is 1958, monthly classified reports from the U.S. Navy and report back to the U.S. on any additional information and um, and they said there's similar contacts existing between our army and our air force. And they said similar other or several other military organizations in other countries. So uh, they actually said like in Brazil, only, the only people um, who work, like the only people in the know are those intelligence officers in our military who actually work on this. Uh, there's a few high ranking officers in the high command there's uh, their own National Security Council, a few scientists, and that's it. Uh, basically, most people are in the dark, they said. Uh, point number nine, uh, this relates to the uh, previous points, super very deep secrecy on UFOs. It's, it's not only classified, they said, it is absolute top secret. Civilian authorities and also military officers in general do not have a need to know. They are not entitled to know. And they said, even our president is not informed of the whole truth. That is the president of Brazil does not know the full story. Very interesting. Uh, I could believe that as a matter of fact. Point number 10 um, is that uh, they said all the experts, all the military experts, all the scientific people who are brought in, we all agree that the people, the public does not have a need to know about this. This would not be a good idea from their perspective. The, they think that knowledge is way too much of a shock. It would paralyze life in our society for years to come. And again, they. Uh, this is an interesting little quote that Fontes relayed to Coral Lorenzen. That they said, we think they're doing a, a reconnaissance of the planet we expect maybe it will last another 10 years before something happens. It was almost like they thought there was going to be some kind of timetable before an open conflict were to occur. This at least was the impression they gave Fontes. Obviously, that did not happen. This conversation's in the late 50s and 10 years, that's just the late 60s. And we certainly did not have an open, acknowledged uh, conflict. But this is what they said to him. They they estimated the probability of these objects being hostile at something like 90%. That was their take on it as what they said to him. And then finally, uh, again, these points kind of roll into each other, but this is how Fontes gave it to Coral Lorenzen, that to conceal the truth in the public, you had to have, there was a carefully planned censorship and disinformation program that's been under operation for many years. The whole policy is to debunk debunk and debunk the whole subject uh, using ridicule that's useful and anything else. Um, and in fact, one thing that they said is that these guys, uh, they've used all the tricks in the trade that is hide evidence and also th um, threaten individuals when need be. Uh, the impression that they gave is that even some people may have been killed or at least if they haven't been killed, 
that's not off the table. There's like, uh, they said, we're not interested in the so-called inalienable rights of people. They said, right or wrong, we, the military, we're going to do our job and no one is going to stop us. That was basically the content of what Fontes is telling Carl Lorenzen in this letter from February 27, 1958. So now, I mean, here's what we can ask. Why should we believe Dr. Olivo Fontes? Is he just, you know, spinning a yarn here? Or, which I don't really think is the case. I mean, first of all, Fontes was a practicing physician. He had a lot of respect in his field and in the UFO field. He, uh, I can tell you, like having read a number of his letters and reports, and you can, I'm going to show you part of one at the end of this here. He, the man was meticulous. He was very exact, uh, very energetic, was chasing down many Brazilian UFO reports at the time, uh, including the Ubatuba incident of which we are still studying it to this day. So that's Fontes. Uh, I think you know, he certainly had the complete trust of the Lorenzans. And the fact is, in his entire life, he never uh, gave any reason why his word was less than stellar, why we should not, uh, you know, take him at face value for what he has had to say. I personally think the man's earned the right to our trust on this matter. And besides, if, if it wasn't the Brazilian naval intelligence who told him this, and who gave him this information? Where is this coming from? There's a lot of detail there. So I think Fontes uh, was telling the truth. And then finally, he gave himself a very reasonable explanation as to why these men would have visited him. He had been to the Brazilian Navy ministry earlier that day, which was their stated reason. So I, apparently he had, had their, he'd gotten their attention. Now, if we choose to believe all of Ofantes, and I, I do choose to believe, I totally believe the truth of that letter, we, we could ask, why would these naval intelligence guys have spoken to him? Why? Well, the, the first obvious reason is that they wanted the fragments of the Ubatuba crash. That was clear. Failing that, they clearly went to plan B, which was that they wanted to win him over. They wanted to make him compliant with them doesn't seem like that succeeded, but that was their goal. So to do that, to get him on your side, you got to give something to get something. So they gave him this information. Was their information true? That's theirs. Now we're getting to the, the real nub of the matter. Well, we can't know for 100% certainty, but I will just say this. After 65 years, uh, everything that he wrote that I just described to you struck me as incredibly plausible and actually is quite accurate. I think it describes the UFO situation of today pretty darn well. And what's remarkable is that this is from early 1958. Again, 65 years ago. Now, in the 1950s, there was, there had already been, I should say, some talk about UFO crash, retrieval, and recovery. Uh, and this, of course, most famously was from a, a very well-known book by American writer Frank Scully that was published way back in 1950 called uh, Behind the Saucers. And his book had discussed the Aztec UFO crash and the recovery of small alien bodies. So the claims had been out there for at least eight years when uh, almost eight years when Fontes wrote his letter. So you could say, well, maybe he's just working off of that. But as many people know, Scully's book was almost immediately subjected to a withering smear attack uh, not long after it was published, with the result that nearly all UFO researchers just ran away from the idea of crash retrievals until the idea is revived in the 1970s. Although, again, what became uh, obvious from my interview with Alan Levine and now from this letter is that at least the folks at APRO were, had reason to be open to the idea of crash retrievals. And this is, I suspect, one important reason why. The Lorenzans had a very high regard for Olivo Fontes. And so I think this letter would have had a strong impact on their thinking. 
And again, keep in mind, this is a long time ago. Fontes is talking in detail about, well, not detail, but he's giving some explicit facts about six UFO events. And in 1958, six crashes would definitely seem like a lot at the time. Uh, that's you know, that's one thing. And, and he's talking about multiple small bodies having been acquired. He's talking about an intensive program to study all of this, all back in 1958. And in addition, you have a scenario that he's describing of ongoing confrontational and at times hostile encounters between the world's militaries and these other beings. And with, we should add, some information about some of the technical aspects of the UFO craft themselves. Not a great deal, but enough to make it interesting. And you have an acknowledgement, or at least a, a statement by Fontes, that the cover-up of the UFO subject was essentially an international conspiracy. I think that's the right word we want to use here. So uh, all, of, all of those reasons, I think, are enough to, to make us recognize that in the 1950s, you had, it, it didn't, it wouldn't take a lot of imagination to kind of fill in the blanks with that reality about the nature of the UFO cover-up. You know, it's one thing to say, uh, as the Pentagon today says in their utterly uh, banal manner, well, we, we don't know, but perhaps there's something out there and we are investigating it. We're going to make sure it's not a threat to blah, 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 blah. That's what they do. All right. That's one thing. It's a totally different scenario to recognize that craft have come down, they have been recovered, and that there is extreme intense secrecy on the entire matter. That's a very different scenario. And this is a scenario that uh, I have believed is the truth ever, ever since I started researching UFOs in the 1990s. And here we have Oliver Fontes describing essentially that exact scenario back in the 1950s. I think it's fascinating indeed. Now, one more element to this story that I find fascinating, I suspect you will find fascinating. So by the time Fontes wrote this letter to Coral Lorenzen, again, we're talking February 27, 1958, Dr. Fontes had been investigating, just recently had started to investigate another very dramatic event in Brazil from nearly the exact same part of the country, Sao Paulo metropolitan region. And this is the incredible story of what happened at a place called Fort Itaipu, right at the Atlantic coast. Uh, I have a, this is an artist's rendition of what we're about to see. This is happening at two in the morning on November 4th, 1957. And uh, I took this, uh, I adapted this, or I took this from Coral Lorenzen's description in her book. She did a very detailed description of the event, all based on Fontes analysis. What had happened is that this happens in November, and it was three weeks after this event happened that one of the officers at the army base contacted Fontes and told him what happened. So he, uh, that's by the late November of 1957. So Fontes was just learning about this. As it turns out, it would take him uh, almost a year and a half, actually more than a year and a half, to get some good corroboration on it. But he did get that corroboration, which actually completely supported the initial story that he got. So what you really have is on a, a very hot, dark night. Remember, this is November, but in the Southern Hemisphere, that's summertime. Uh, there was no moon out, so it was very dark. You have two sentries at this fort. This fort apparently had been built uh, several centuries earlier, and it still had, I think, uh, the impression I got is that it had some old-fashioned cannon out there. Maybe they were just for display. I don't really know what this was about, but this was an old fort, and there was really not a lot going on. I mean, it's the coast of Brazil. Um, in the middle of the night, I'm sure no one was expecting anything to happen. So you've got two sentries on duty, two guards, and they see something at about two in the morning, that's very unusual. It, it looked at first like another star that just like appeared, but it turned out to be something else entirely. This, it, it was an incredibly bright object that started moving toward their location at a very high rate of speed. 
And in their opinion, as they stated later, nothing that they knew of could fly this fast. So they were in a kind of state of awe at that. And then within seconds, this object is over the fort. It basically stopped over the fort and then it slowly drifted down. It had a very intense orange glow around it, which is indicated in this image here. And in fact, uh, it, it threw shadows behind the men. So it was bright, a very bright glow. It was hovering at about 150 feet above them. Uh, well, 120 to 180 feet. So split the difference, about 150 feet. It's very low. It was motionless. The, the sentries are, at this point, they're in a state of absolute shock. Uh, and the object was described as pretty large, about the size of a large aircraft. But it, was, it wasn't the shape of an aircraft. It was round. It was disc-shaped. This image doesn't really indicate that. But they said it was disc-shaped. And there was this orange glow around it. So it had been totally silent upon the approach. But now that it was close, the men heard a distinct humming sound coming from the object. So it's over their head and, and nothing happened for about a minute. And then, then it, things really get crazy. So first they started hearing a faint whining sound. And then right after that, this incredible uh, wave of heat hit both of the soldiers, extremely intense. Like, like the experience of being on fire, that level. Like they said, it was like fire burning all over my clothes. One of them said, um, you got this UFO that's humming and you've got this intense heat and, and these two men go into a state of total panic. Uh, one of them is like he said, my only goal is to just get away from this, this invisible fire that's burning me alive. He's gasping and then he, this one blacked out and collapsed to the ground. The other sentry had the exact same feelings, like my clothes are on fire. He begins screaming desperately. He's stumbling, he's crying. He's like a trapped animal, he said. And he didn't know what he was doing, but somehow he managed to skid into uh, some kind of protection, he thought, between these two heavy cannons that were, that were nearby. His screams, woke up the garrison, the other guys that were inside the installation. So they're wondering what is happening, what is going on, there's all confusion. You have uh, men and officers trying to reach their battle stations in this fort. And then suddenly the lights throughout the entire structure go out. It's a blackout. The entire electrical system uh, that made everything in this base work was dead. The entire communication system was also dead. Someone tries to turn on the emergency system that apparently failed to function as well. So these guys were helpless. Total confusion, panic, not just with the two guys who were burning, but the uh, men inside the fort. Uh, and then uh, after apparently a short period of time, the lights came back on again. And at this point, the men go to um, prepare to face like an enemy that's attacking the fort. So they go out. Some of them are out in time to see this orange light climbing vertically above the fort and then moving through the sky at a high speed. And it's apparently it's just gone. Uh, one of the sentries was unconscious on the ground. The other was just hiding, mumbling, crying. Uh, they were both badly burned. They were both put under medical care. Uh, um, they had first degree burns and second degree burns of uh, over more than 10% of their bodies and mainly in areas that were covered by clothing. Very unusual. Fontes wrote a report on this and actually tried to give his own analysis as to why. And you'll be able to read that. I will show that to you uh, before we're done here. It's very, it's fairly long discussion. Um, so that's that. The whole uh, whole event lasted for just about three minutes. That was it. So the very next morning, November 4th, 1957, the fort commander, who was a, an army colonel, uh, orders everyone, like, you are not to discuss this, not with anyone, not with family, not with relatives, nobody. 
uh, intelligence officers come to the base. They take over. They're working frantically to stop everyone from talking. Uh, a top secret report was said to have been sent to headquarters. And then a few days after that, the Americans arrive. You have American officers with um, the U.S. Army military mission. They come to the fort. They are accompanied by officers of the Brazilian Air Force to question the guards and any other witnesses. A special Air Force plane, I don't know if it was U.S. or Brazilian, I assume Brazilian, takes the two injured sentries to Rio de Janeiro, where they were completely isolated behind a tight security curtain in the Army's hospital. It's called the Central Hospital there. So it was three weeks after this incident that Dr. Fontes is contacted by one of the Army officers who was there that night. Now, you could say, well, how is that realistic? You know, they were all ordered to silence. It's true. They were. But I think it, you know, it's important to remember that security protocols, I don't think were all equally followed in every country in all situations at all times the same way. I just, I've never gotten that impression. Uh, here we are in Brazil in the 1950s and security was broken. I think it's as simple as that. Someone wasn't supposed to, but they contacted Oliver Fontes. And uh, he couldn't, he did go to uh, Central Hospital. He was not able to uh, see the soldiers there or meet with them. He did learn, he did get confirmation that there were uh, those two centuries who were there. Um, by the time he was writing to Coral Lorenzen, I think he was unsure where they were, but for two months, they definitely were at that hospital. Um, the only other uh, follow-up on this, Fontes himself was glad to get the one report, but that was not enough for him. So he really tried to work this case. And it was he's a very was a very meticulous uh, researcher. It took him a, more than a year and a half where he finally was able to fully establish that those soldiers were definitely there. He, he believed that they were there, but then he somehow got confirmation. And then it was in May of 1959, this is 20 months after the incident, that he finally located and interviewed three other officers who had been present that night. And, and what he said is that their story corroborated the first one in um, every detail. So that's, that's that whole event. Um, he wrote an analysis of the technology that might have been able to do what was described in that report. This was reprinted in Coral Lorenz's book um, from 1962 and 1966. The 1966 version I'm going to show you right now. It's called Flying Saucers, the Startling Evidence of the Invasion from Outer Space. And I'm just going to show you this. I'm not going to read it to you, but for those of you who want to screenshot this, uh, I think the, let me, yeah, this is uh, the best resolution I could get. These are the first three pages. And you can, sorry about my logo covering a little bit of that, but I think you, you should be able to read it. And here are the next three pages. And you can screenshot this, uh, presumably, and read these um, pages of Coral Renzen's book where she discusses this incident and Fontes's report. This is Fort Atipu. This is not the Ubatuba incident. Fontes was investigating both of those at this time. Very interesting stuff. So what are some important takeaways from this look back into history? Again, I will just emphasize that our public conversation on UFOs doesn't come anywhere near the level of detail and immediacy, I would say, that you get from looking at some of this early evidence. Um, this type of evidence makes our current discussion seem to me just utterly tepid and maybe not entirely meaningless, but getting there. You know, I mean, what, what is our military and our public, you know, official status saying about all of this? Is like, uh, is there something out there? Hmm, yeah, maybe there is something out there after all. We're just starting to look into this. We'll get back to you when we learn anything. That is essentially where we are today in 2023. That's where we are. How absurd. 65 years after Fontes wrote his letter in this report. And, and he was just one, 
researcher back then doing this kind of work. He wasn't the only one. He was a good one. But there was a lot of this work being done. <clears throat> we need to keep our history alive. We are in danger of losing it all and of entering a true era of historical amnesia. Who would have thought that this could happen in the so-called age of information, right? Well, it has happened. Well, perhaps that age of information might be better called the age of propaganda, at least to some degree. But we do have tools at our disposal, and that includes the tools of historical research and of, of contemporary research as well. And when we really get into the nitty gritty of this subject, the UFO subject, right down to the most granular detail that we can, then what previously seemed like a superficial or perhaps a mildly interesting subject, well, it starts to become much more important, very important. You can see why some people over the years have taken this very seriously, even sometimes at the expense of their careers. There is a reason for strict control over this subject. <clears throat> but I would encourage us to remember the attitude of Dr. Olavo Fontes. He believed in freedom of conscience. He believed in freedom of research. And ultimately, he believed in the value of truth in our society. In truth, truth isn't always very popular at parties or national security bureaucracies or, or the medias that they dominate. But I think that Fontes and his entire generation of that bygone era, I think he and they were right to believe in the power of truth. I mean, what else do we have? We have the truth. And as far, you know, as I, as I have tried to demonstrate here, a great deal of the truth that we need on the matter of UFOs is in the history. We do not want to forget that history. So with that, I guess I'll, uh, I'll wrap it up. I will thank you for being here with me. Please do subscribe to my channel. If you like what I do, hit the like button, get notifications. Um, you can also go to my website, Richard Olin Members, to get this kind of information and much more. I do this type of thing on that website um, every week, all the time. So thank you. I'll see you next time. And let's remember to keep fighting the good fight. Later. <laughs>